We'd like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. My name is John Hines. Once again, I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ in North Ridgeville, Ohio, joined by Daniel Sanders, preacher for the Norwalk Church of Christ in Norwalk, Ohio. Daniel, how are you doing today? Uh, pretty good. Been busy with everything. Getting ready to move next week. Getting ready to move. So this will be our last podcast, at least for the foreseeable future, in person. Yes. So once you get settled in, we will probably figure out how to do it uh, online and get back to get back to our studies and such things. But we'll, I guess we'll give you a week or two to get settled in. Okay, and then we'll crack. Appreciate the whip. that. Then we'll crack the whip. Appreciate that. So that'll be putting us probably the week of March 18th. Yeah, somewhere in there. Might give you a little a little more time. We'll we'll see. Might take a. Take a little siesta, take a little break, um, because I know you'll be busy getting settled in down in Arkansas. But as for today, we are actually going to finish up the Sermon on the Mount today. So we're at the tail end of Matthew chapter 7, and and I'll read the passage because we're going to use primarily your notes for, for this. So let's just read together. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. All right, Daniel, where we want, where would we like to start in looking at this passage? Well, we're looking at the we're looking at the conclusion of everything here. Jesus is giving a uh, pretty long list of different types of things and different material to teach on. I mean, he's hitting on so many different points in life and being able to look at how we can be found pleasing and acceptable to God. And as we look at this, I want you. I want to be able to kind of emphasize here in uh, verse twenty-one and verse twenty-two. First of all, that not everyone who says to me, "Lord, Lord," you know that "Lord, Lord," I think it's. I think we may have discussed it before, but it's a term of endearment. It's, you know, it's not just. It's just not. It's not a repeat error. It was a term of you know sincerity and everything, where people were calling Jesus Lord. And he says, "Not everyone who says this is going to enter into heaven," and. I want to I want to emphasize of uh, it matters how we obey God. You know, many people in those days said, "Well, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name?" You know, there's a there's a lot of good things in, in in those three categories. There, John, I think we can make a point. There was there was a lot of good that was uh, that was attempting to be done supposedly with 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 these three different works that they were talking about. Talking about works of prophecy, being able to try to cast out demons. We see there was demon possession still at this point. And people that were doing wonders in the name of Jesus. And not everyone who does those things, not everyone who calls Jesus Lord, not everyone who does good things is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the main focus, getting back to the centerpiece of it all, as what Jesus was doing here in each of these three chapters was focus on God's kingdom. Give your entirety to doing God's will. Jesus laid out on what God's will is, being able to hit a substantial amount of, of information here and being able to say, okay, here it is. This is what you need to do. You need to focus on God's will in order to enter the kingdom. Well, let me ask, because it would be easy to say, 
for, for one thing, the Lord is speaking. Hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm, I don't even know if futuristically is a word. This is the beginning of his ministry. Yes. And I was, I was actually <coughs> just looking. I don't believe he's given his disciples the power to cast out demons or to do miracles yet. I don't think. This is, this is early on. So no one, no one has prophesied in his name yet. No one has cast out demons in his name. No one's done many wonders in his name. He's speaking in the future. Yeah. Just as he's speaking in the future, um, as he speaks about, I will de- declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. That he's, he's setting himself up and he's asserting, he's asserting his authority. We'll, we'll talk more about that as as we go along so my question i guess one of the questions i would have is these people seemingly what what's the problem if they're prophesying in his name and they are casting out demons in his name it it can't be that the lord is saying look at what the lord says not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father. Well, surely prophesying in the name of the Lord, casting out demons in the name of the Lord, and doing many wonders in the name of the Lord, surely that is doing the will yeah. of the Lord's Father in heaven. So what's the hang-up? What's the problem, I guess, is is one of the questions I would have and you know, to just look at it, that it's... Yeah, like I said, it matters how we obey, mm-hmm. and it could be I, it could be that those are those are more showing. You know, the, the, that kind of you know, people that are able to prophesy, people that are able to cast out demons, people that are able to do many wonders. It kind of goes along with what's going on in chapter six, where he's trying to get away from the looking at me thing. Yeah. You know, there could be some of that inclusion, possibly. So that that may speak to motivation. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, well, we've we prophesied in your name. You know, for example, there's the account of the itinerant, oh, what's it called, the itinerant Jews who were going around and they were saying they were trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And that's the account where the demons say, Jesus I know and Paul we know. We don't know who you are. Yeah. And they were just trying to call the name of Jesus like this ceremonial thing. And and basically, it's like, well, why why would you do that? And it's because you you want the attention on you. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is like Simon the Sorcerer claiming to be someone great. And to your point, all throughout the sermon on the mount, it's like you need to stop doing that. Yeah, you, you need to stop thinking it's it's about you. Um, the nature of our faith usually is more is, is more private, and um, if you do your works to be seen by men. Well, you'll have your reward, yeah. And this may be be touched on that. I was also thinking about oh, what what's the first church in Revelation? The the first church in Asia, who's the first one? Ephesus. In Ephesus, they did a lot of stuff, right? You know, he says, "I know your works that you do. I know you've you know." They did a lot of stuff, yeah. So, what was their hang up? Leaving the first love, and so it's possible to do works, but not do it out of love and we're back to motivation. Right. And, um, you know, first Corinthians 13, you know, Paul says I could, I could have all the faith in the world, but if I don't have love, I could give my body to be burned. And it's like, well, that's a good thing. Giving your body to be burned, you know, it's sacrifice. So yeah. what if you, you don't love though? I, if I had, you know, spoken the tongue of angels. And so it's, you know, I just think it's interesting that on the surface it, it seems like a good thing, but it gets to how how are you obeying? What's your motivation for obeying? Yeah. What what's your motivation for doing for doing these things? Um I also was was thinking about work salvation. <laughs> and you know, the Pharisees trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And they would tithe right down to the spices in the cabinet. <laughs> you, you know. And it's like, okay, they, you know, they were very, they were gung ho on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Other stuff they were negligent with, you know, the weightier matters of the law, faith, mercy, justice, because those things are often intangible. They focused more on the tangible and the stuff you could see, like the spices in the cabinet. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, 
just the idea of they trusted in their works. Yeah. Right. And, um, and we can do the same thing. We absolutely can. That, that we can, we can be like that fair, you know, the Pharisee and the tax collector. You know, I thank thee that I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I give tithes on all that I possess. I do this. I do that. And you can see, see the same thing here. It's like, we prophesy in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We do many wonders in your name. And it's, are you still saved by grace? Cause it doesn't sound like it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what, what's your opinion on that? You think that's, you know, he, he could be speaking about all of those things. And yeah, it's just I, interesting that, that you would tag Jesus with, we've done these things in your name. And the Lord says, for whatever reason, I never knew you. Yeah. I, you know, it's just, it's amazing, you know, getting, they're getting away from the weightier manner, uh, weightier matters of things they need to get back to seeking and serving god and jesus is, is he's trying to lay it out on how we are to follow god and yes we can do these great things but if we have not if we've lost the motivation if we focus on if we give that more attention that desire to these other things and forget about the the zeal for seeking and serving god plainly and simply we're missing the mark we're missing the mark with everything where, you know, again, good things, profitable things. Uh, we don't want we don't want to sit there and, and just simply obey. We want to be able to we want to be able to have a uh, we want to do other things and we give more preference to that. That's what we see the failure of what was happening with in, in these times of people that are following Jesus was that they didn't want to do those those basic things, the simple things. They wanted to great wonderful mighty things that people be like wow that person must be very spiritual wow that person must be you know fasting look at the way he's emaciated himself wow right. this person's standing up over top of everybody you know it goes back to all that i think as well and gets us into that next part where we're going to answer before god yeah before we move there well okay i wanted to also add you know we were speaking about this off air the idea of just just stamping Jesus's name on something. Yeah. And here it's like, okay, they're prophesying, they're casting out demons, they're doing many wonders, but there's a, there's a lot of people out there who it's not that they're obeying for the wrong reasons. They're disobeying. Yeah. <laughs> but they think just because they stamp Jesus's name on it, that it's okay. Exactly. And that, that goes along with, uh, you know, Today we see people. Well, I'm building. I'm building these buildings, building hospitals, building charitable facilities, and different things. Doing all these things in the name of God, in the name of right. Jesus. And could, are they are they beneficial? I think there's a lot of benefit. There's a lot of help that that people can do with those things and putting it in the name of Jesus. But it gets away from truly what doing things in the name of Jesus is. Yeah, and you is just, doing the Father's you know, will. To think about the the work of the church. You, you know, yeah. one of that we've had podcasts on that before. <laughs> And, um, he, you know, we, we've spoken before about the issue of just, just because, uh, just because a church is called the church of Christ, that doesn't mean they're following Christ. Exactly. Uh, you can, <laughs> I think there does need to be a, you, you know, a scriptural name, if you will, but it's, it's about ownership and ownership is about following the Lord. Right. And there's a lot of folks there. There are a lot of folks who call themselves Christians who are not following Christ. There are a lot of churches that call themselves churches of Christ that aren't following Christ. It's not a guarantee any more than just saying, Lord, Lord, is a guarantee that you're practicing righteousness. That's right. It's That's not the case. You actually have to do the Father's will and do it for the right reasons as well. So anyway, just wanted to touch on that. All the, the There's just so much religious division today. And everyone thinks that it's, you know, well, it's in the name of Jesus, so that makes it okay. Well, uh, no. No, it's not. <laughs> it, Jesus is not a rubber stamp just for us to approve whatever we want to approve. We need to be following him. And, you know, as, as he says in this account, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. All right. So where you want to go to next? So next part is, you know, about this answer before God. That goes into verse 23. You know, I will declare them. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, again, 
we're going to we're going to stand before God on that on the judgment day. We're going to stand before Him. We're going to hear words of welcome. Or we're going to hear words of doom. You know, we have the ability to be able to to uh, make our actions known before God and being able to be found pleasing and settle inside of God, or being able to hear the you know the doom of everything. We have uh, that ability. We're going to stand on the judgment seat. You know, here in, in Matthew seven twenty three. You know, he's speaking about the judgment to come. You know, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier on here in Matthew 7 about the ability to judge. And we were talking some about God being the righteous judge of all things and how we're to be able to use that judgment in a, in a proper way. But also 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 down to verse 11 speaks about how whether we are, you know, whether Paul was absent there or absent or present with the brethren there in Corinth. They needed to make it their aim, and it was his aim to be found pleasing to God because we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Everything that we've done in the body, whether good or bad, will be brought before God, and it is a terror. It, it is an awful thing to stand before the living God and be hearing these words of doom depart from me. I think that's one reason that that resurrection day is judgment day. Yeah. Because God will says God will render to each one according to the deeds done in the body, and it's like we are resurrected, and we are judged. Yeah, and that's that's what it is. And Matthew twenty five clearly shows that judging all the nations will be gathered before Him. This is when the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and you have accountability and it's like he will he will judge that is that is his role he will set the sheep on his right hand the goats on the left and the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world and by the way he goes on and he talks about i was hungry and you gave me food you know mm -hmm. and then he fl gives the flip side of it yeah. and they're like well when did we do this in as much as you've done it to the least of these, your brethren, you've done it to me or not done it um, as well. But yeah, you have accountability. You, you know, that's back in our Matthew 7 passage. Many will say to me that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, he he is putting himself out there as Messiah. This is early on. Yeah. And, and there's there's a reason they're like, who do you think you are? You know, that's what they're thinking. It's like, right. who, who do you think you are? You know, what What do you mean many are going to say to you in this day? And it's like, yeah, he's, this is the claim. <laughs> they, they better, they better listen. It's like, this is the claim. He's it, claiming to be the son of God. He's claiming the, to be the Messiah. The, the, the eye opening statements uh, of everything here. You look at Matthew five, six, and seven, Jesus is teaching, you know, they, they had already had an understanding of things, but he kind of goes deeper and he says, well, you know, that whole, uh, You've heard that it was said, I tell you now. Yeah, yeah. You know, we start seeing some of this more and more and more. And, you know, he's telling them, you know, you got, you got to, you got to, you got to get your life right. You, you think that you're doing things right. You've heard that it was said this way, but I'm telling you it's, it's different. It's different uh, what, when it comes to seeking and serving God. And you're falling off the mark because here he goes on to say, I, I'm, I will say to you, as you as you're just putting out, I will say to you, I never knew you. Yeah, he's speaking to those people who were followers, supposed to be followers of God, followers of Jesus. He said, I'm speaking to you. I never knew you. Yeah. There's that eye-opening statement of realize you need to make changes and realize that I am truly the Messiah. Yeah, verse twenty-one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom but those who do the will of his father. It's like, who do you think you are? Yeah. It's like, I'm the Messiah. And with the Messiah, with being the Christ, guess who has authority? Right. <laughs> and he is, he will hold us accountable. He will hold us accountable. And that, that accountability is, so we, we have to examine ourselves. Yes. We have to examine ourselves and being ready for the day that's coming. Uh, we don't know when that time, yeah. you know, we get, we get spend a whole lesson on, you know, the time of everything. We don't know that. What we do know is it, and it's what Jesus is saying here. We have to be ready. Yeah. I was, I, there was a video this morning, a little clip, and they were talking about the, 
current Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You know, it's been going on for about yes. 4,000 years. But anyway, the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and there is some televangelist or someone, and he was talking about how Jesus was going to come down and that there was going to be the rapture and that he was just going to end all that, you know, and on an Armageddon. And it's, yeah. you know, painting that, you know, the, the, that figure as they believe it of, of judgment day. It's like, Jesus said he didn't know when the day was going to be. Who do you well, think you are? Well, <laughs> you think this, is, you think this is the one, huh? It's like, there's been a lot of people who have tried to, there's been a lot of people who have asserted that they knew when the day that the Lord is coming back and they've all been wrong. Yeah. And Jesus himself says, I don't know when he comes back. It's going to be like a thief in the night. And when Peter writes about that and he says, it'll be like a thief in the night and the earth and the world, the world and all the works are going to be burned up. Therefore, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy conduct? We're to be making our life yeah. right with God while we have yeah. the opportunity. Yep, because we will be held accountable. Yes. And if, if we come along and we say, we didn't know, and it's like, that's what the Lord's talking about. Uh, I told, I spoke. Yeah. I spoke. Were you not listening? Yeah. And that's that's that thing that a lot of folks, you know, we have to have ears. We need to have ears to hear. So accountability, where you want to go to next? Well, I want we, we start touching base on it because I think it ties in. We're going to jump a little. We're going to jump to the to the end of the of this text here uh, about Jesus's power and authority. Yeah, I want to touch base with that because we're standing before God. We're going to answer before God, and as we were just kind of leading into that. You know, not everyone who says to Jesus, again, we're talking about an authority figure. And, and I want to pick up looking at verse 28 and 29. When Jesus ended this, the, 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 this teachings or these sayings, the people that heard were astonished at his teaching. For he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. Again, here it is. The people that were witnesses of this account heard Jesus speaking and it was different. It was it was spoken differently than the, than like what the scribes do. They're just writing down what had already been said before and just re reiterating it. Here Jesus is speaking on a completely different manner to the people as one that was having authority and being able to speak in this way. Again, you're going to answer for God. You're going to say to me, Lord, Lord, right. and not going to be able to enter into heaven. But those who do my Father's will. And he's going to be the one to declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practice lawlessness. We were talking earlier on in chapter 6 as well about the need for confession. Uh, when we are looking at the the model prayer earlier on, uh, we read about, you know, uh, if, you're, uh, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Uh, we start talking about the idea of confession, about being able to forgive and being able to confess different things. Um, we're, you know, Jesus said if we confess him before all, he's going to confess us before our Father in heaven. We see this idea and this thought of being able to look at forgiveness and confession. And again, that goes back to Jesus' authority, Jesus' power that he has. I've got more to say on it, but I'll go leave it, turn it over to you real quick. I know you got something. You know, con concerning authority, you know, it's an odd thing with Jesus. And I, I was talking about this Sunday night in our Zoom study that we have over at North Ridgeville. And for, for example, when the paralytic is let down through the roof and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. And they also basically say, well, who do you think you are? Or they are at least thinking that. And Jesus says that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say, take up your bed and walk. He had, Jesus had, and I'm, I hope I, I I hope I have it right. <laughs> because my, my question is when we get up to the cross and the resurrection, and eventually Matthew twenty eight, all authority has been given to me. My question is er, when was it given? That's my question. Philippians two talks about he emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation, he emptied himself. He made himself a servant. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The word becomes flesh, dwells among us. And in the the study that we had Sunday night, it was we, we were looking in Hebrews chapter five. And in Hebrews chapter five, I won't 
rehash the whole thing, the study from Sunday night. But some of the things it says about Jesus are are interesting. For example, it talks about verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his godly fear, and that he feared God. And though he was a son, verse 8, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered in having been perfected. He uses that phrase, having been perfected, and that is the word for complete there. And that he, the Christ, had to suffer. That's what had to happen. And all, all of this all of this eventually is going to speak to Acts chapter 2. This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. All authority has been given to him. Um, oh, what's, what's the verse from 1 Corinthians 15? Sit here till I make your enemies your footstool. And we, we think about Jesus, the Hebrews passage. And don't worry, I'm not I'm trying not to get on too much of a tangent. <laughs> When Jesus was born, he was born under the law, right? He was born under the old law, and he kept the old law. I did not come to destroy it like he says in the sermon. I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. And that, when did the law change? Change at the cross. It's like that's when the new covenant, my blood of the new covenant. When did the priesthood change? At the cross. Right. When did everything, where's everything pointed? the cross and the resurrection. Okay. Here, here's a little, they're here in Hebrews five. And I was, I was just thinking about this idea. Hebrews five, verse five. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son today. I've begotten you. And I, I asked the question, when is that today business? When, what is it talking about? And Jesus was not a created being, like Jehovah's Witnesses say. He, he, that's, that's not who Jesus was. All things were created through him. All things were created for him. But still, I wanted to try to answer that question. When is, in the Hebrews 5, today I have begotten you? What is that talking about? And I think a lot of folks would probably say, well, when the word became flesh. But when we look, I want you to come to Acts 13. Thanks for turning over the reins there for a second. Now I get to just, <laughs> I just get the rain. In Acts chapter 13, at verse 33 is where the verse shows up again. And it's a quotation from the Psalms. But Acts 13, at verse 33, God has fulfilled this for us. Um, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you, and that he raised him up from the dead. No more to return to corruption. He has spoken this. I will give you the sure mercies of David. All of it's to say this. When, you know, the Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me. And it's like, I think he had a measure of authority before that, that you may know the son of man has power to forgive sins. But all of that is predicated on him going to the cross. <laughs> You know, when he goes to the cross and he dies, it's not just for the transgressions of those under the new covenant. It's also for those under the old covenant. Yeah. It's all predicated on the cross. That when he goes to the cross and when he's resurrected, it's like that's the begotten. It's not when he's born in the flesh in Bethlehem. It's when he's reborn and he comes from the tomb and he's declared to be the son of God through the resurrection. And it's like, Oh, so in Ma so all of that's to say in Matthew, going all the way back to Matthew, and I know we're taking the scenic route, and it's like, as I said, he's speaking about the future. You know, many will say to me in that day, not everyone who says to me, you know, and I will, you know, he's speaking about the other side of the cross. You know, it's like, this is just the beginning. But he's already making <coughs> assertions about, I am the Messiah. Yeah. And guess what I've come to do? I've come to teach, but I've also come to die. And I'm going to be raised on the third day. And yeah, that's 
And, and so when you get to Acts 2, it's like, oh, this Jesus whom you crucified, God hath made both Lord and Christ. Even, even that language there, it's like God has made. You know, it'd be easy to say, well, I thought he was always Lord in Christ. It's like, well, he emptied himself. He emptied himself. He came in the flesh. And then all of a sudden, let, let me put it this way. See if I can. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Did that happen when he was a baby? No. No. <laughs> did that happen? Did that happen when he was 30? Nope. <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen at the beginning of his ministry. But at Judgment Day, uh, you will respect the Lord's authority that he has been given because he's been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Yeah, we see the prelude. Of, we'd see the prelude of everything with, uh, you know, there, for instance, in Matthew 17, uh, where Jesus is transfigured on the mount here. God comes to those disciples that were with him. Here's Moses, there's Elijah, there's Jesus, yeah. and the other two left, there's Jesus right. standing alone. And it says, you know, here it is. You had the law and the prophets yeah. all right there. This is my, this beloved, is my son. beloved son whom yeah. I'm well pleased here. We see some of that confirmation leading right. up to everything, right, kind right, of right. going to everything. Where he's, he's still Jesus. He is the son of God. Yes. Not taking anything yes. away and from it was, and for them. In, in he his, is who he is. He, he was there in his ministry. It was just kind of that, that, that even that further confirmation of everything, I guess we could say for Peter, James, and John to be okay. We have high regard for Elijah. We have high regard for Moses. Here's here. They're gone. This is who you need to listen to. And that kind of carries over. Then that does carry over into the continuation of his ministry. And then when he goes and is uh, put to death on the cross, they yeah. scattered and then he comes to them. And then we see the, their, their, their confidence or boldness, their ability to be able to further seek God still in their life. It becomes more and more apparent after his death. Yeah. And, and I mean, there in, you know, the, the Hebrews passage, and it just, it, it moves us to think about how it says that Jesus learned obedience by yeah. the things which he suffered. And while his whole life could be characterized by sorrowing, I think, we're, we're speaking more about at the end. Mm -hmm. And that, oh, he, he was still learning. Yeah. And of course he was still learning because in the garden it's let this cup pass from me yet not my will, but thine be done. And he's recognizing his father's authority and that in subjecting himself. And he calls us to do the same thing. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my father. It's like he, he, there's a claim to Messiahship, but he's still pointing people to God. Yeah. He's still pointing people to the Father. Yeah. And he's doing the same thing. He's he's subjecting himself to the Father. Right. Um, I guess is my point. He, even in recognizing his his authority. And that oh, Daniel, I could go on and on about I, I think it's I just think it's fascinating. Yeah. That, and, and I don't mean this don't take this blasphemously. <laughs> don't this isn't about you. The father is not the head of the church. He's not. Um, doesn't take anything away from him. Jesus is the head of the church. This is why in 1 Corinthians 15, when it says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom back to God. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. And I mean, it's just, there. there's more things going on. Right. Jesus, the son, is the head of the church. The head of, you know, 1 Corinthians 11, the head of man is Christ, the head of Christ is God. But the Lord's authority, Jesus' authority, specifically Jesus, it's been given to him. Yeah. God, uh, God says someone had to give it to him. Who exactly, gave it to him? Exactly. You know, and the one who gave is accepted. Yeah. Scripture talks about Anyway, sorry, rant over. <laughs> but yeah, the end of Matthew 7, right here, simplified. It's about authority. Yeah. It's about authority. It is. The authority of Jesus it, it, and the authority of his father. Yeah. And, and it's the authority of what he had to say on all these different matters going from prayer, fasting, the way we're to conduct ourselves, right. marriage, 
judging. I mean, you know, what what are what what were we focused and worried about? You know, nothing but seeking the kingdom of God, uh, having that focus on that. Uh, there's so many different weighted matters that Jesus spoke about, and right. it shows, it further confirms his authority that was going to be given that yeah, was yeah. given to him. And and he's already, he's laying the foundation. Yes, he, you know he's already. It's like he, even in Matthew 28, go make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Well, when did those commandments start? That's where we're reading. <laughs> yeah. It's like the Sermon on the Mount is early on. This is this is the beginning of that. It's the establishment. And the um the all authority is tied in with it's like whoever hears these sayings of mine right. and does them. Not just hearing, but actually doing. We're to build on that foundation. First Corinthians three yep. talks about building on the foundation of Christ and then we build upon that. Yep. And we'll see if we'll see if we'll stand or not. Yep. But God has laid it out on how and what we're to be, you know, being structurally, structurally uh, in instruction on found, on what we're to build and how we're to build. Yeah, because the floods are coming. Yeah. The, the floods, the trials, tribulations, they do come. Right. And ultimately judgment will come and all will be all will be tried. You know, that's the point. Wise man and the foolish man, uh, they're both prepared. They're, well, one's preparing, one's not preparing. But the same day comes to both. Yeah, and that gets into the to my last point that I had was with the ability to choose. Yep. Looking at verse twenty four to twenty seven, kind of backtracking a little bit here. But after the authority has been established, after understanding we're going to answer before God, and after looking at how it matters, and here Jesus lays it all out. We can either listen to him, or we don't listen to him. It's the same. Uh, same thought, like for instance in Joshua twenty four fifteen, yep. when the Jews and Israel entered into the promised land, Joshua said, "Here today, I challenge you. You have the ability to choose for yourself whether you want to go back to the gods on the other side of the river, following the gods of the of the different the Amorites and all the different Indians that we have destroyed. You can choose them." You can choose the God who delivered you to the land this day. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua gave the uh, Israel the, the ability to choose. They they always had the ability to choose. Not even even before that time, even before Joshua made that statement, and even after that statement, they have the ability to choose God or not choose God. And Jesus here in Matthew 27, verse 24 down to verse 27, he's offering the same ability to choose. You can either hear God and obey it, be like a wise builder, or you can be like a foolish builder who hears these sayings but does not do them. We have the ability to choose, to right. do or do not. Jesus laid it all out. He has spoken God's word to you and I to this day. And there are blessings that can come from it. There are consequences that can come from it. So where and what and how do we want to build our house? By the way, that account in Joshua, um, that was when Joshua was an old man. Yeah. And uh, there was still a lot of idolatry in the land. And I was just reminding myself, went back and looked, because they all say, oh, we're going to serve God. Yes. And Joshua says, okay. Um, put away the foreign gods which are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And then what do, you, what you do they do? Get to serve both. Yeah, and what do they do after that? Which, is, <laughs> which you, 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 know, you say that right there. What did Jesus say in in the previous chapter? You can't serve two masters. You right. can't serve both. You can't serve both. That's what Joshua Joshua said. The yeah. same Choose. thing. Choose. Choose. <laughs> It's one or the other. Yeah, it's one exactly. Or the other. You know, and so what does Israel do after we get in, when we get introduced to the time of the judges? They say we're going to turn to you and we're going to turn to God. Was right. it in those days there was no king and Israel yep. did what was right in their own eyes? They turned back away from God and established their own righteousness, their own ways, which is what Jesus was trying to get the the Jews to see the error of their way here in Matthew's five, six, and seven. And Jesus doesn't do the choosing for us. No, he just doesn't. And um, he offers the ability on everything, all the facts. I guess you could, you will just kind of plainly put it: the facts of what we need to do and how we can do it. Right. We can listen to it. Right. It's all there for us. 
but it's up to us to actually listen to it and apply it. The yep. application is on our side. You know, I was um, looking at the account in, of the Passover in the Old Testament mm -hmm. when the Passover was first instituted. And God tells him what to do. And he says, you know, the angel of death was going to pass over them. And the Egyptians, the firstborn, was going to die. And no one doubts. It's like, did did the Hebrews deserve that? Did they deserve God's mercy? No. No. Nobody ever deserves it. <laughs> no. All, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. We're saved by grace. Right. That We are absolutely saved by grace. Yeah. But did they have to put the blood on the lentils, on, on the doorposts? It's like, yeah, God was not going to apply the blood for them. It's like they had to take the lamb, they had to kill the lamb, and they had to put the blood on the doorposts. That was the part they played in it. Does that take anything away from the fact that they were saved by grace? No. But was there something they had to do? Yes, us were saved by grace. We're saved by the Lord's blood. Is there still something we have to do? Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. The Lord doesn't do the hearing for us. That's right. It, it goes, it goes again, we, we're, I'm revisiting what we've looked at. because all ties together. Matthew 6, looking from verse 25 down to verse 33, all the animals, the birds of the air, God, God provided food. What did the birds have to do? They had to go gather it. They had to go and do their part in order for them to eat. They had to go gather the food for themselves. God is providing the things for us in this life. He provides the physical things, but again, we're speaking, let's speak on the spiritual things right now. What do we need to do? Seek first yeah. the kingdom of God and, and his, his righteousness. righteousness first. Yeah. And, and the Lord, it's like, he doesn't do that for us. Right. He gives us, he instructs us. It, it's, you know, and at the beginning of Hebrews, God, who in various ways has spoken to us in times past, but now speaks to us through his son. Yes. Okay. So what do we have to do? We have to listen. Right. <laughs> and do it. Right. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and, and, does, and them. does them. A lot of folks would hear them, but hearing they do not hear and seeing they do not see. It, it, it's an old statement that uh, a gentleman who I used to work in Arkansas, his name was Ray. And Ray, he would speak things and you, 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 you ain't listening. He always said, you ain't listening to me, boss. I can hear every word that Ray was saying. And he was speaking to me and our supervisor. But if people didn't listen to him, he's like, you know, you're, you, you're hearing me, but you ain't listening to me, boss. Keep on saying that because we can hear those things and, and you know, the listening, sometimes when we look at the word listening, that's the application of everything, what we're hearing, what the audible sound is, and then putting it into practice, what we're hearing right. with our ears. We're listening, you know, kind of taking it to the next level. And that's just my own, yeah, my own thing and looking at that. Yeah. Can I share one more little tidbit? And this is beyond the sermon after the sermon ends. Um, I'm doing, sort of a series back in North Ridgeville because what comes before the sermon is Jesus talking to the disciples saying, I will make you fishers of men. Yeah. And I like to think that the Sermon on the Mount, that is, it's the beginning of their training yeah. to be fishers of men. It's like, okay, you go through the whole sermon and everything that we've talked about for the last, how long have we been doing this? A year and a half? How long have we, no, we haven't been doing it a year and a half. You haven't been in yeah, no, North Ridgeville a year no, and a half. It's not even a year I yet. I know. <laughs> But we've been doing it for the past however many weeks. And, you know, it's like, okay, the disciples, it's like, they're, it's like, okay, we need to become fishers of men. Yeah. And then smack dab, Matthew chapter eight, after the sermon's over and everyone's amazed at his authority. And Matthew eight, he comes down the mountain and a leper comes and worships saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus put out his hand and touched him saying, I'm willing to be cleansed. That was unheard of in those days. And my point is, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's like, well, okay, what kind of men are we looking for? Obviously, we're looking for the righteous, right? We're looking we're for looking, the self-righteous. As we were talking earlier, we're looking for the strong men. We're looking for yeah, the yeah, yeah. for the real good-looking men and we're, all all the different. We're things looking like for that. the rich young rulers, and we're looking for the Nicodemuses, and we're yeah. looking for the we're looking for the elitists and those who you know blow a horn when they do a charitable deed. Yeah, and then the Lord's like. I also came for the lepers, for the, and lepers it's, the harlots, what? the tax collectors, the harlots, the Samaritan woman and John. What? And it's like, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them 
well, but but can't we just can't we just love our friends? No, you got to love your enemies. Yeah. Oh, and it's, this is what it means to be fishers of men, and this is what it means to follow the Lord. Yeah. And I just, you know, I I'd, I'd never noticed that before. It's like right after the sermon ends, and boom, he's touching a leper, and you can just see his disciples being like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, look at the idea of excommunicating them out of the city like they did with the lepers in the Old Testament. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and we'll say, you know, to the Lord's authority and the Lord's power. Yeah. When the leper says, if you are willing, and Jesus says, I am willing, be cleansed. It's like, that's authority and that's power. Yeah. And so... Anyway, I just thought it was a, an interesting account. The account right after that is the centurion servant, right? I mean, we could just we could just keep going on, Dale. It's, oh yeah, it's just great because because he go he he goes and gets it personal because he gets to uh, Peter's mother, right, mother in law there. After right. that, I mean, he starts he he starts healing so many different types of individuals, and just and it's it was, not it the was, ones who they think it would be. Not, exactly, <laughs> it's not the ones that he was thinking or they were thinking that it would be. Yeah. And then we're not too far. Let's see. Matthew chapter nine is also Matthew the tax collector being called. You know, there you go, tax collector. What? What why are we going? Yeah, why are we going after all these people? And if you don't respect the Lord's authority, mm-hmm. and you don't respect what the Lord's doing and wanting to do, and how He's shaping us, you'll miss the boat. You'll yep. miss the boat. Yeah, and you'll end up. You'll end up being like those in our study today. Have we not cast out demons? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not done, done all this in your name? If you if you miss the boat, it's like, what about the the lepers? And yeah. What about the Gentiles? Yeah. And what about you know? It's like, no, you better get on board with the Lord. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, right? So, anyway, appreciate it, Daniel. Appreciate it as well. Yep, been good to study with you. Um, best wishes moving. Thank you. You next know, time I'll be in Arkansas. Next, we'll be, yep. Next we'll time we point. have this, we'll be in Arkansas. Um, appreciate everyone's prayers because you're moving and I'm helping you load the truck. You love me that much. So, or I told you that you need to love me that much. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we don't both throw our backs out. <laughs> so anyway, hope the move goes well and um, look forward to future studies with you. And for all those who are tuning in, we appreciate you following along with us. And we hope hope these studies are beneficial for you as well as we all look to Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you very much. Thank you.